This phrase will have virtually no disputants in the contemporary world. Jesus' earliest followers had experiences that they thought were appearances of the risen Jesus. Virtually nobody disputes that. Bart Ehrman says, no, I don't dispute that. It's determined historically. We know it's true. Why would I say I dispute it? It's just true. The argument that you're about to hear for the case for the risen Jesus changed a generation of how scholars think about this issue. It's Dr. Gary Habermas, a New Testament scholar, dishing out cold, hard, historical facts for the resurrection of Jesus that even Bart Ehrman admits to, as you'll hear about later. I will save most of my commentary for the end, but to save you time, we're going to be jumping around a lot in this argument, and I'm going to fill you in as we go along. First, he establishes whether or not scholars trust the reliability of the Apostle Paul's writings, which will be important for later. Let's get into it. Which of these books do they accept by Paul? Well, almost unanimously, they will always accept the same books. It's not like some half, accept one half and somebody else accept the other half. They will always accept Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1st Thessalonians, and of course Philemon, but that's a one chapter non-theological book, not terribly helpful. But the other ones, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1st Thessalonians. Bart Ehrman, probably the best known skeptic, in America. He calls himself an agnostic leaning toward atheism and the foremost skeptical New Testament scholar in this country says these are the authentic Pauline epistles. No one's going to give you problems if you use this material. Now does that mean everything Paul wrote was true? No. Does that mean Paul was inspired? No. What does it mean? It means he was in the right place at the right time. We know who he was. He's a scholar. He was changed by this message. So that's, there are some dynamics there that are worthwhile. He's just somebody who knew what was going on at that time. And very importantly, as you'll see in this lecture, he knew the other people who knew what was going on. He knew the other eyewitnesses. So that's what authoritative means. Not always right, but scholarly and in a position to be right. And we know who he is. It's especially important to note here that scholars take Galatians and 1 Corinthians to be historically reliable texts. And this is important because these texts outline the historical account of the eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus in a timeline of the life of Paul, which is important for later. But at this time, most scholars saw the historical case for Jesus to be pretty unreliable because a lot of the source texts that we have for this, like the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are dated 30, 40, 50, even 60 years after the death of Jesus. But in the argument that you're about to hear, it brought about a case where scholars could not deny the fact that material for the resurrection of Jesus came one to two years following the death of Jesus on the cross. Some scholars even saying within six months of the death of Jesus. Check it out. I'm going to drop this second argument that says the New Testament is in the right place, right time, fulfills the criteria for, for historiography. Now, from this point on, I'm going to be doing my minimal facts argument. I'm going to be citing only data. Probably 95% of what I say from now on will be accepted across the critical spectrum from conservative scholars to atheist scholars who study these disciplines. Interesting. They're all going to agree with almost everything I'm saying here. What makes Bart Ehrman say that we can get Paul's report from just plus 25? What makes Bart Ehrman say that we've got plenty of material from one to two years after the cross. How in the world can a guy who is, quote, an agnostic leaning toward atheism, how can he say we can get this material back to plus one or plus two? All right. So Paul is writing here, 1 Corinthians 15. There's no difference on the date. Some people might say 53, some people might say 57, but it's not determined by whether you're conservative or liberal or whatever. About 55, that's a nice round 25 years. But Paul says, first two verses, when I came to you Corinthians, this is the message I gave you. In other words, when he came to them, he said it, and now he's writing it down. When did he come to Corinth? Some people think that this is the most ascertainable debate, uh, date in the entire New Testament. 51 AD, 51 to 52. How do we know that? Well, because the New Testament mentions 
a city leader who was in control of Corinth when Paul came to Corinth. And an inscription has been found in stone with this guy's name on it, and how convenient, these city leaders, city-states, remember, in Greece, they were chosen for one-year terms. And it's known that he ruled the city from 51 to 52 AD. And when Paul came, he was in control. All right, so Paul says, I'm writing to you here what I said to you here at plus 21. And he says in verse 3, again, I gave you what I was given as a first importance. We're talking about the heart of Christianity right now, he says, and I'm telling you what I was told. Okay, interesting. Here's the question. When and from whom did he receive this material? Do we have a clue? When and from whom did he receive this material? All right. We talk about the arguments if you want to, I'm not sure how long I'm here afterwards till I get uh, carted off to do something else. But if you want to talk about reasons, we can talk about them. But let me give you the scholarly, the critical conclusion. Bart Ehrman's going to agree to this. People who don't even think Jesus lived, which are like not on the, Bart Ehrman just wrote a whole book against them saying, you guys don't have credentials, you're out of your field, stay in your own field. That's a skeptic writing to the skeptics. It's kind of a fun read. I have to, you have to tell you about their arguments, but virtually everybody, virtually everybody, Richard Bauckham, Cambridge University, says this is a consensus position among scholarship. They believe Paul received this material about 35 AD. You go, what? Plus five? Yeah, plus five. How in the world would they know that? Let's do the math. Here's the cross. We're calling it, for a nice round number, we're calling it 30 AD. When did Paul have his Damascus Road experience? Or, for skeptics, when did Paul think Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus? It was either plus two or plus three. Plus two or plus three. Paul says, Galatians chapter 1, an authoritative book, according to the definition I gave you earlier of authoritative. Galatians chapter 1, Paul says, Galatians 1, 16, I met Jesus. And then he said, I didn't go running up to Jerusalem to meet those who were apostles before me. I went out into Arabia by myself for three years. Now, some people think he was preaching and all kinds of other stuff, but we really don't know. He said, I went off for three years, and then I went up to Jerusalem. All right, again, let's do the math. Here's the cross. When does Paul come to the Lord? Plus two. You say, well, I think it's plus three. Great, plus three. Three years later, he goes up to Jerusalem. Three plus three, six, 30 AD. Oh, well, I think he was converted to 32 AD. Okay, great. Two plus three, 35. And in Galatians chapter 1, Paul says, I went up to Jerusalem after three years, so we're plus five or plus six after the cross. And Paul says, I spent 15 days with Peter, the head apostle. He said, I saw no others, no other apostles, except James, the brother of Jesus. Then, as we go from the end of Galatians 1 to Galatians 2, no chapter break, he says, 14 years later, I went back. All right. Fourteen years later, I went back. Critics, Bart Ehrman, um, Hummet Kister at Harvard, they put this event at about 48 AD. We're still only plus 18. He went back, and Galatians 2.2 2 is one of the most incredible verses in the New Testament. I love the, the way the King James translates it here, but uh, most translations say just about the same thing. Paul says in Galatians 2.2, 2, I went back up, after 14 years, to see the other apostles and to set before them the gospel I was preaching, to see if I was running or had run in vain. What? Yeah, I went back up to Jerusalem to make sure we were all on the same page, 
to make sure we were all presenting the same gospel. Neat. So we, want to make, we do want to make sure that you guys were preaching the same thing. Galatians 2.2, I went back up there. I shared with them the gospel I was preaching. And then just a few verses later, Galatians 2.6, these five words in English, they added nothing to me. They added nothing to me. Then just three verses later, they, this is where we get the phrase, they laid hands on Barnabas and me, and they gave us the right hand of fellowship, and they said, y'all go to the Gentiles and take this message. We're going to stay here and give the message to the Jews. But the point is, the message was the same. They added nothing to me. All right, one more thing and I'm done. So far, I've been focusing on this point right here at five to six years after the cross. But I'm going to assert that we can get back all the way to the cross. We can close this gap. Why does Bart Ehrman, what I started with, why does Bart Ehrman say we can get this message back to one to two years after the cross? Why does he concede that? Why do skeptics, you know, why has the table certainly totally changed on this? Because of this creedal argument, and in the New Testament, there's, there are, they can tell that this was early preaching. This is, the, this is what the earliest apostles preached coming out of the gate. All right. This is when Paul heard the message, hysteresi, Galatians 1.18. This is when he did the firsthand research. Now, if Paul and, and James, sorry, if Peter and James gave it to Paul, they had it before he had it. Now, when I say an early creed, one of the reasons they know it's an early creed is because in the Greek, it reads stylistically. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and following reads like this in the Greek. Da, 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 da. Two stanzas with data, and not a rhyming sequence like American, uh, like English, but with a, with a, uh, a, a way that's easily memorizable. Why? Because most New Testament scholars today believe that the vast majority of Jesus' audiences, contrary to other things you may have heard, the vast majority of Jesus' audiences were illiterate. Wow. Up to 90%. What do you do when you teach somebody who's illiterate, but you want them to teach somebody else? What do you do? You tell stories that they'll remember. Ah, parables. And you give them short, pithy statements that they will memorize. Turn the other cheek, walk the extra mile, do unto others that they will memorize. And when you codify things into a da 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 especially if there's an Aramaic original, which is the language Jesus speaks, now we know you're really going back in the church because somebody had to put this together. All right, Paul hears it. They had it before Paul. Someone had to codify it. You had to get it from the events to the da 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 and we're right on top of it. To bring this full circle, make a comment or two and I'll be done. Many things in the ancient world depend on one witness and two make an event unimpeachable. Two. Bart Ehrman says we have 11 different sources, historical sources for the crucifixion of Jesus. Dang. So here's what you get, bottom line. This phrase will have virtually no disputants in the contemporary world. Jesus' earliest followers had experiences that they thought were appearances of the risen Jesus. Virtually nobody disputes that. Bart Ehrman says, no, I don't dispute that. It's determined historically. We know it's true. Why would I say I dispute it? It's just true. And we don't need Paul's writings to prove what he's saying. We have 11 independent sources that even Bart Ehrman and the rest of modern academia agrees on, which is Josephus, Tacitus, Mara Bersepion, Suetonius the Talmud, Pliny II, Lucian, Thallus, Celsus, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and James Ossuary. 
We can't run from the historical fact that Jesus died on a cross in 30 or 33 AD and that Jesus' early followers really did think that the risen Christ appeared to them. And they were willing to die for this fact and testify for it and be martyred. Some of them horrible deaths being burnt alive, crucified on crosses and stoned to death. And human psychology says that people are not willing to die for something that they know to be a lie. And we can verify the historical accounts of these people dying for the fact through the early church fathers like Tertullian, Polycarp, and Origin of Alexandria, and the early historians such as Josephus and Eusebius. But even so, what we can do is try and come up with an alternative explanation that explains these facts without a supernatural element. And one of the prevailing theories we have here is the hallucination theory, which basically says all these people who had appearances of Jesus, or at least thought they saw him, had hallucinations, temporary delusions, something of that sort. But the main flaw with this theory is that there are times when Jesus appeared to groups of people at the same time. And if we look at the clinical studies about hallucinations, we find that when people experience hallucinations, people never have the same hallucination in a group at the same time together. Hallucinations, they're individual subjective experiences. And even when there's groups of people who are together and hallucinate at the same time, they have their own subjective experiences and their hallucinations are different. They are not all the same. If we couple this also with the fact that Jesus appeared to different people over a span of weeks from different personalities, different backgrounds, different ways of thinking, different social classes, and they all testified to the same thing. And so even if we find a way to rationally fit these flaws with the theory in a way that makes sense, we also have to figure out how this fits in with the empty tomb because Jesus' tomb was empty. So this is that we have to find the most reasonable explanation here for all of this. And given in light of the facts that we have here of the historical Jesus, I think it's most reasonable that the evidence points to Jesus really rising from the dead and appearing to these people. But this is not an airtight argument. This doesn't prove Jesus or God. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about this in the comment below what you think about all this. And if you want to learn more about the evidence for God and Jesus, please check out the video on screen right, right up there. Have a great day. Thank you.